Have you always wanted to know what everyday life was really like in the Middle Ages? Were the people of that time really as crazy as our current cliches claim? Stay tuned and make up your own mind. Before we get started, be sure to hit that like button and ring the notification bell for more videos. Here are 15 true everyday events from the Middle Ages that will be hard to believe. Have fun watching our video. The Dark Ages The Middle Ages still have a stubborn reputation for being one of the darkest chapters in world history. But was this Dark Age really as dark as it's often made out to be? Admittedly, there were definitely more pleasant things than dealing with the plague or the Hundred Years' War. In truth, however, the Middle Ages were also a very exciting time for science and education. Not only did some impressive thinkers like Thomas Aquinas and the mathematician Leonardo Fibonacci live at that time, but the universities of Oxford and Cambridge were also founded during the Dark Ages. The arts also flourished during this time. The first great international art movement was called Romanesque. Architecture in this style was characterized by massive round arches, towering stone and brickwork, slender windows, heavy walls, and art and sculpture in this movement largely figured biblical scenes. The next major movement to come forth was called Gothic, which was known for its ornate style. Gothic architecture featured enormous stained glass windows, pointed arches, rib vaults, and flying buttresses. In fact, this style would come back into popularity centuries later with the Gothic Revival in England during the late Victorian period, which is why Westminster Abbey was created in this style. Busy Cemeteries Today, cemeteries are quiet places where the bereaved can say goodbye to their loved ones in a protected, respectful environment. In the Middle Ages, however, cemeteries were not just places where the dead were buried. They were something like public meeting places where there was a lot of activity. Many important events in a city, such as elections, debates, court hearings, and even theatrical performances were held in the vicinity or directly in the cemetery. At night, many a lady is said to have crept into the cemetery to offer certain services there. Well, it must have been cheaper than renting a room in a brothel. Ossuaries Amidst all the hustle and bustle that prevailed in the medieval cemeteries, we shouldn't forget that burials were, of course, also carried out there. Sometimes, however, the problem arose that the space in the cemetery became increasingly scarce. So, to make room for more burials, the remains of the deceased were exhumed and placed in so-called ossuaries. Ossuaries, coming from the Latin word os for bone, consist of a chest, box, or other structure where skeletal remains are deposited. When you look at the countless skulls and bones that still romp around in many ossuaries, a cold shiver can run down your spine. Cutlery Habit In German, there's an idiom that translates to handing in the spoon, which means to die. Kind of like kick the bucket in English. In medieval times, farmhands were given a spoon at the start of their service, giving them the right to eat. They handed it back when they finished their term of service. And now you might be wondering why the saying doesn't talk about handing back the fork. Well, that's simply because forks weren't that common back then. There are different theories as to why people in the Middle Ages preferred to use just spoons and knives. It's generally assumed that the fork was considered uncivilized and strange. It looked barbaric, and the tips resembled the devil's trident. Shoe fashion Classic, sporty, or elegant. When it comes to the question of preferred shoes, each of us has our own taste. If we now take a look at the footwear that was fashionable in Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries, we realize that medieval footwear fashion was really high-end in the truest sense of the word. 
In fact, the so-called beaked shoes were so pointed that we wonder how people at that time managed to walk reasonably normally. The length of these extravagant shoes was closely linked to the official dress codes and was based on the social class of the wearer. And today we think women wearing high heels have it bad. Here's another interesting tidbit. It was against this background that the phrase living big arose, which is still common today. Disinfectant. It doesn't matter whether it stabs, cuts, or bites. Anyone who's been injured is well advised to disinfect their wounds as soon as possible. What applies to our modern, everyday life can, of course, also be applied to the Middle Ages. Only people back then didn't have the alcohol-based disinfectants that we can easily buy in shops today. So, what did medieval physicians do? They used urine for this purpose. Even Thomas Vickery, the personal physician to King Henry VIII, advised soldiers to treat any injuries sustained in battle with urine to prevent infection. This may be gross, but survival experts today say that it actually works, provided that the urine is freshly passed, otherwise bacteria levels increase and don't provide the desired cleaning effect. Still, aren't we lucky to have alcohol wipes today, though? A fun football game Can you believe that football, or soccer as Americans call it, used to be banned in England? It sounds pretty funny given how popular football is there today. As you can already imagine, the game back then was very different from today's matches. It was like a violent brawl. Strict rules? None. Something like foul play, useless, as long as none of the players die. A professional game ball, an air-filled pig's bladder will do. Even the team sizes weren't precisely defined. Not only was the game a total free-for-all, but spectators got pretty out of control too. It wasn't uncommon for a whole mob of people to rush through the area and happily riot. Things got so out of control that by the early 14th century, King Edward II was forced to ban the game of football. But Edward had an ulterior motive. Football was distracting men from practicing archery. And why did he need archers? To fight against France, of course. But by the time King Henry VIII rose to the throne, football was back on the field. In fact, Henry VIII is thought to have owned the first pair of designated football shoes. They were listed among the royal wardrobe. But when Henry VIII grew too fat to play anymore, he too banned the game, supposedly on account of the mobs. Stretcher Sample when earthly investigations reached their limits, sometimes help from the afterlife was needed. In fact, the so-called Barr test was used in the Middle Ages to prove the guilt or innocence of an accused murderer. For this purpose, the suspect was brought to the laid-out murder victim. The accused then had to place his hand on the deadly wound of the corpse and protest his innocence in the form of a prescribed oath. If blood then came out of the wound, the suspect's guilt was proven. However, if this wasn't the case, the accused was allowed to return to his normal free life. This practice was based on the assumption that the soul of the deceased was still within the corpse. If the corpse began to bleed during the stretcher rehearsal, the ghost wanted revenge on the murderer. Trial by Fire However, the stretcher test was by no means the only unusual line of evidence used by the medieval courts. Another ordeal, the so-called test by fire, was also one of the common means by which an accused could be convicted. The suspect either had to walk barefoot over red-hot iron, carry the scorching hot metal over a certain distance with his bare hand, or put his hand directly into a fire. If the suspect remained unharmed or sustained wounds that healed within a few days, he was innocent. In all other cases, a penalty awaited him. Hairy Suspects What seems almost unbelievable from today's perspective was still commonplace in the courtrooms of the Middle Ages. So-called 
animal trials. In fact, criminal trials were held against animals that had gotten into trouble with the law. This could include, for example, pigs that had attacked children, or cattle, horses and dogs that had committed other crimes. In court, the hairy defendants even got their own lawyers. Once the four-legged friends were found guilty, they had no more laughs. They could be drowned, hanged, burned, or buried alive if convicted. Once, a whole flock of animals was convicted of not providing assistance because they'd watched a woman being raped. The Life of the Peasant When we think of farmers these days, images of self-employed laborers who own many fields and a large yard come to mind. However, the life of medieval peasants was anything but free, quite the opposite. At that time, the farmers typically tilled fields that had been allocated to them by their sovereigns. In return, the farmers were obliged to pay taxes in the form of labor services and food. In addition, the peasants could be sent to war by their masters at any time. As we can see, the everyday life of the rural population really didn't have much in common with the rural paradise of our days. The Way to Knighthood Participation in major tournaments, glory on the battlefield, unreserved admiration from the rest of the population – all this is now associated with the everyday life of a medieval knight. The problem – rising to the rank of knight was anything but easy. Whoever wanted to achieve this exalted status had to be of noble birth and possess enough money to afford weapons, armor, and horses. Wealthy families sent their sons to noble houses at the age of eight, where they initially served as pages. At the age of 14, the youngster became a squire and completed a rigorous apprenticeship. If he successfully broke through this dispensable period, he was knighted at the age of 21. Now, all of that sounds way harder than going to high school and college, but the perks were you could make it into the great legends, like King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. Bloodletting Known since ancient times, bloodletting was still very popular in the Middle Ages. Because proper blood circulation is essential to our health, medical professionals of the time believed that they could heal a sick person by literally draining the bad blood from their body. It doesn't matter whether it's an ordinary cough, typhoid fever, or even the plague. Bloodletting was used for practically every physical ailment in order to remove the suspected pathogens from the organism. To conduct the procedure, the medical professional would make one of two choices – to make an incision close to the affected part of the body, or to make the cut on an opposite spot on the body that was thought to correspond to the impacted organ based on medieval medical beliefs. Interestingly, medieval medical treatises showcased detailed illustrations for bloodletting. The images showed where it was appropriate to make incisions depending on the symptomatic body part. However, since a noticeable healing effect could only be proven for very few clinical pictures, this procedure disappeared from the medical practices over time. Conquest of Constantinople in 1198, Pope Innocent III launched the Fourth Crusade to retake Jerusalem from its Muslim rulers. In 1202, the army was ready to attack and received specific orders not to attack Christian states, though ultimately the Crusaders were not supposed to heed these instructions. So it was in April 1204 that the army conquered, sacked, and partially destroyed Constantinople, even though it was the largest Christian city in the world. Wheels we associate wheels with bicycles or the tires on cars, but wheeling was a bestial form of capital punishment that awaited convicted murderers or robbers in the Middle Ages. First, the victim was pinned to the ground, after which the executioner smashed his arms and legs with an iron wheel. In the next step, the doomed man was tied to a wheel, which was then erected on a pole. 
Whether the executioner then decapitated, strangled, or threw the condemned man alive into a fire depended on the seriousness of the crime committed. Obviously, this was terrible for the condemned person, but could you imagine if your day job was acting as this executioner? Now it's your turn. What do you think of the 15 strange things from the Middle Ages? We're already looking forward to your comments. Please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the unknown list so you never miss one of our videos again. Thank you for watching. Have a good one and see you next time.